War is a social construct and an interaction between political communities. Its expression changes in line with the tools we use to make those interactions. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to the organisers of the Roland Seminar for inviting me to address you on the concept of manoeuvre in the 21st century. The quote I just read out is from an article by Zachary Tyson Brown called Unmasking War's Changing Character on the US Army's Modern War Institute website. It discusses the forces of societal change, particularly the importance of information as a commodity in society, which underscores what we call grey zone or hybrid wars. We are challenged by this because we consider war and peace to be binary, and we have a cultural predisposition to use military means to deal with the majority of security challenges. We look at countries such as Russia as an exemplar of state actors who seem to deftly use all methods and means at its disposal during peace and war to exert its influence in pursuit of its strategic objectives. Clausewitz said that war is a continuation of politics by other means. We tend to focus on war, while others focus on the continuation of politics by other means. And the inf information age has enabled the pursuit of these other means. Today I'll propose a different conception of manoeuvre as a unifying concept that brings together all elements of national power to place our nation in a position of relative advantage within the context of perpetual grey zone conflict and competition. If strategy provides us with a goal, manoeuvre, primarily strategic manoeuvre, will be the method for achieving those goals. I'm relatively new to the concept of manoeuvre more broadly, having been introduced to it by a few Armoured Corps officers in the context of manoeuvre warfare and air land battle, one of the central doctrines for joint warfighting in the 20th century. Like Officer Cadet Wooding, I tend to keep the company of other service officers. It's good to see it starting from a young age. Generally, I'm the only blue in a sea of green. I've been thinking about manoeuvre concepts in relation to war, but have reached a point where I think I can offer us a framework for addressing security challenges beyond warfare. I'll put a, a disclaimer up front, I'm a lawyer after all, and I'll put the ideas, the, the ideas I present to you today are quite raw and still a work in progress, and I'm very keen to share them with you as part of the process of refining my own thoughts and interacting with you on all these ideas. Consequently, what I will discuss today is not manoeuvre warfare, but rather a different framework for considering manoeuvre concepts to address the challenges that we face after two decades in the 21st century. So I've got four ideas I want to present to you on how the strategic conception of manoeuvre gives us a way of addressing the multifaceted and persisted security, persistent security challenges that confront us today. Firstly, I'll talk about why the information age is very different from the industrial age and why the use of force alone as a means of solving security problems is ineffective for any long-term solution. Second, we'll quickly examine the origins of manoeuvre theory and, and purpose um, and look at why it's still relevant today when considering a coordinated and strategic approach to meeting the challenges of hybrid war. We can conceive of strategic manoeuvre as a unifying foundation for taking action in addressing these threats. I'll then talk about why we need to change our way of thinking about the utility of military force in addressing some of these grey zone challenges. I think that we intuitively know that the use of force has limited utility in trying to subdue ideology and ideas in the information age. Yet we are still susceptible to what Cathal Nolan calls the allure of battle to address these complex threats. And finally, I'll talk about why air-mindedness is so much more important today than it has ever been. In general terms, this is because our air power capabilities are incredibly sophisticated. And when considered against the allure of battle, the temptation exists to use it as a rapid solution to many security problems. I'll argue that air-mindedness today requires air power experts to have a greater strategic sensibility to more effectively advise government on its utility in providing enduring solutions to security problems in the information age. Warfare is directly influenced by changes in society. The first two decades of the 21st century have witnessed the diffusion of power, which demands a broader approach to addressing security challenges. The industrial age was characterised by mass production of consumer items as well as military material and weapon systems. Indeed, the world wars of the 20th century were won in the factories and capital markets of the world by Westphalian states that could effectively harness industry towards its war effort. 
Today, industrial might has been eroded by the information revolution. Alvin and Heidi Toffler envisaged this in their work, War in Anti-War. The Tofflers said that while land, labor, raw materials and capital were the main factors of production in the second wave or industrial economy of the past, knowledge, broadly defined here to include data, information, images, symbols, culture, ideology and values, is a central resource of the third wave economy. The outcome, they concluded, is the demassification of mass production. Today, we're at a point of having what the Tofflers called a split-level economy, based on both declining second-wave mass production and emergent third-wave technologies. This is re perhaps reflected in the mix of capabilities in our own ADF. However, when the Air Force is transitioning towards these third-wave technology-based systems, which rely on information as their lifeblood. The transition between industrial and information-based social systems is perhaps eroded the monopoly on industry and capital held by states. In other words, coercive effects are no longer reliant on the use of physical force by the military. Information is a new weapon system of this age, and it's, it is the vector for shaping and influencing perceptions of reality and decision-making in a manner that is favourable to one side versus another. The manipulation and shaping of information have always been at the heart of conflict. Information is analysed and processed to create intelligence, which forms the action, informs the actions of commanders. The importance of information to command means that opposing forces have sought to shape, deny, manipulate and alter information to influence decisions made by their adversary. One of the better known deception campaigns of the Second World War, Operation Fortitude, was how the Allies deceived the Germans about the invasion of France and influence German attitudes about where such an invasion would likely occur, and therefore the placement of defensive positions and units. So what is different today? The free flow and accessibility of information during the information age effectively means that an adversary can shape, deny, manipulate, and alter information to influence whole societies. War is, after all, a social phenomenon. So why focus only on the military forces? Why should not shape the cognitive dimension of all citizens in a nation by manipulating the information that they access so that their actions are more favourable and advantageous to you? The adversary, states or non-state actors, can now shape action through the vector of information. And Klaus has said that war is an act of force to compel an enemy to do your will. In the information age, one no longer needs to rely on force to achieve this. P.W. Singer explores the, explores the use of social media in this manner by non-state non actors like Daesh, whose invasion of Iraq in 2014 was, as Singer says, launched by a hashtag. Daesh is an interesting case study in how to effectively use social media to influence, convince, and coerce a global audience to support its cause. Daesh uses information environments to support and complement its operations in the physical space, tweeting about its success in all forms of media to push its worldview and rally people to its cause. Anonymous is another influential non-state actor that uses cyberspace as a vector for action, which is varied, seemingly anarchic and decentralised. Daesh can and has been dealt with via military means, but it remains to be seen whether this is a long-term success. The difficulty in engaging these entities with purely military means is that it is likely to be limited to the short term. Long-term solutions that address radicalisation and curb the factors that incentivise people to rally to these organisations do not entirely reside in the military. Enduring solutions to such security challenges require a synchronised approach offered by what I propose is a new conception of manoeuvre. Another perspective on how information shapes action is provided by a US Army Major, Major Mark uh, Romanich. It's depicted in this slide that information is the bridge that connects cognitive processes, perception and decision making, and the physical world, which is manifested in action. Today, data is the critical raw material, information is its weapon system. A failure to treat data as a strategic resource cedes precious time and space to our adversaries. And like any raw material, data must be harvested, refined, and delivered. To do this in a manner that has enduring, effective, and advantageous strategic effects relies on a coordinated strategic manoeuvre approach. 
The Russian approach to conflict and competition is perhaps an exemplar of effective strategic level manoeuvre. Dmitry Adamski wrote that Russia's new generation warfare campaign, which is centred on information struggle, is where the battlefield is perception and strategic calculus of the adversary is the centre of gravity. NGW is aimed at imposing strategic will and information struggle has a number of characteristics. It's holistic in that it merges technology and cognitive psychological attacks aimed at deception, disorientation and demoralisation of the population or the military. It's unified in that it's synchronised across military and non-military activities and it is uninterrupted in that it is conducted throughout the spectrum of war and peace and towards domestic and international audiences. <coughs> NGW is intended to focus on influencing, shaping and manipulating perception, decision making and behaviour while minimising kinetic engagement. We in the West are generally labelled as, have generally labelled NGW as hybrid war and we consider it to be new. However, as Adamski has noted, this is not new but a part of Russian strategic culture which considers a holistic approach and considers struggle, particularly information struggle, to be the totality of strategic interaction throughout war and peace. Adamski says that competition with the adversary is seen by Russians as protracted, occurring towards, during and following kinetic phases of interaction. This is somewhat different from the Western military thought focused more on kinetic activity. Further, Western strategic thought considers the, a division of labour between military and politics, which is not present in hybrid war. And this is where the new conception of manoeuvre is useful because it's about using the information domain as the foundation or fuel for coordinated action along all elements of national power to achieve a position of strategic advantage across the spectrum of conflict and competition or war and peace. There is a rich discussion in academic literature and military publications about manoeuvre or the manoeuvrist approach. It's generally conceived of by many as the opposite of attrition which is often associated with the positional war experienced during the First World War. Some of the literature draws upon Sun Tzu, who said that to fight and win 100 battles is not the acme of skill. To subdue the enemy without fighting is the acme of skill. Maneuver is also about shattering the will of the adversary or causing some cognitive dislocation so that the adversary is incapacitated or rendered ineffective before physical confrontation of battles need to occur. However, the reality of warfare is that both manoeuvre and attrition have a role to play. Then Major General Sir John Kazili provided an excellent overview of manoeuvre in um, a Rusi article. He examined and considered the writing of Little Hart, J.F.C. Fuller and William Lind and found that part of the issue is that many theories, theorists debated manoeuvre versus attrition but didn't really come to an agreed definition. I like the definition of Edward Lutwak that uh, General Kazili used. Um, and how Lutwak used the term manoeuvre, which describes an approach that is aimed at achieving disruption and exploiting weaknesses of a particular adversary. Lutwak talked about relational manoeuvre, which is aimed at systematic destruction, incapacitation, collapse of the enemy system as a whole, rather than cumulative destruction arises from a series of attritional engagements. After passing through the myriad definitions, I found that generally two aspects to manoeuvre. The first relates to the use of force by fire and movement, what we traditionally consider manoeuvre warfare. And the second relates to the use of deception, manipulation, scheming, adroitness and other, and other means that do not involve physical contact. It's about mentally outmanoeuvring the adversary. It is this second aspect that lends itself more to the information age and why we need to consider manoeuvre for addressing the 21st century security challenges. In, indeed, General Kazili himself acknowledges the concepts of manoeuvre has applicability to all levels, of, from tactical to strategic. He saw the manoeuvrist approach as always seeking alternatives to the attrition before resorting to it, attrition being the last resort. From this perspective, I think that manoeuvre has much to offer when applied at the strategic level. The military instrument was only designed for use in war. It's expected to confront a number of security challenges. That's why I found uh, this definition of strategic manoeuvre in the Australian Army's land warfare doctrine um, to be quite uh, useful. This conception is appropriate to information age warfare because, it, li because uh, it looks at all instruments of national power 
And I argue that when viewed from the strategic perspective, manoeuvre provides a useful foundation for unifying and synchronising the efforts across all elements of national power to place the nation in a position of advantage relative to a particular adversary. The information age has witnessed the rise of non-state actors, cyber threats and the use of the information and right to exert power. Our military and strategic mindsets need to adapt. We still have a predisposition towards the use of kinetic force to solve problems, but this approach is not always appropriate. Maneuver offers a way of thinking, uh, of taking a holistic approach to, to tackling these challenges. Western cultural ideas about the use of military force uh, are clearly defined. The uh, military, for, the military is for war and politic, and the politics is for peace. There is no comment about what lies in between. This is why hybrid wars, I think, challenge us. I think the quote by uh, Little Hart really says, um, says it all to me. It's very hard to change culture and military mindset. In the opening chapters of Guns of August, uh, Barbara Tuckman highlights the French obsession with the philosophy of decisive battle, which was a feature of 19th century warfare. Uh, that obsession led to uh, a lot of challenges on the Western Front as um, a lot of generals still adhered to that obsession with decisive battle and the cult of the offensive. Uh, throwing men against fire at that time was the very epitome of what Einstein defined as uh, insanity of doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. At the Marne, Passchendaele and the Somme, we are in many ways in that very same moment in history where we have a choice about sticking to old conceptions on the use of force or throwing firepower against ideas over and over again in Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria and expecting a different result. Or we can adapt to the information age and change, about, change uh, how we think about the use of military force and understand its limits, and perhaps ceding ground to the other elements of national power to achieve the politics by other means. The Western obsession with decisive battle remains with us, and um, Nolan's book, A Louvre Battle, provides an excellent account of Western military history and that obsession with decisive battle. Air power is generally the option of choice in this regard, and when Daesh read its ugly head in 2014, the primary option to address it was air power. For Australia, this meant joining the coalition of 70 plus nations under the banner of Operation Inherent Resolve. I don't think at that point the reaction was to sit at a computer and bash out a strategy and provide an enduring solution for fundamentalist terrorism. It's much easier, and it also demonstrated resolve, to send some bombers over and send them a message, 2,000 pounds at a time. There is a price to all this, and the allure of battle and solely relying on military forces alone can lead to countries gambling on the use of force, with the end result that states have unknowingly entered into long attritional war and suffered as a result. Over-reliance on military options may lead to atrophy of other elements of national power, such as lack of resourcing, and this means that the military forces are generally seen by civilian leaders as the first option to almost every security problem. Rosa Brooks highlighted this she said that the military has become everything, and she describes the military as the Swiss army knife solution to many security problems, even those problems that are not intended for it. In the West, because there is a clear division of labour between the military and other elements of power, the use of mil the military as the default option inevitably stretches the boundary between war and peace and makes the challenge of addressing hybrid war more difficult. Only a strategic manoeuvrist approach can really deal with this multifaceted problem. Ideas cannot be bombed to death. They have a viral characteristic and what James Gleick calls spreading power. Ideas cause ideas and help evolve new ideas. And what is required to fight it is strategic manoeuvre that harnesses all the tools at a nation's disposal in a unified and synchronised manner. There are many whole of government models out there and I use DIME as an example here because it's perhaps the well, most well known. The diagrams at the top suggest that each, is, each lane is equal, but in reality, the military is probably should be the tallest of those columns because it is the go-to for solving problems. We can use manoeuvre to deftly outplay our adversary by engaging in and shaping the information environments in different ways across each of these elements. We can use trade, diplomatic relations, economic sanctions to shape the information environment. 
It requires a long-term investment of years in establishing and maintaining posi Australia's position in the world, assuming that we are certain what that is, but that's a different discussion entirely. And the military element should be there as an insurance policy, a symbol of deterrence rather than a default option when something goes wrong. So how does this relate to air-mindedness? Air-mindedness is generally about having a deep understanding of air power to enable it to be effectively used to achieve national objectives. This includes understanding how to use it to have strategic effects. The development of air-mindedness, just not, not just in Air Force members, but in all members of the ADF, relies on experience and professional education. In addition, to understand air power as a form of military force that can be used rapidly beyond the horizon and its synchronization with other elements of national power to gain an advantage requires military members who are both air-minded and manoeuvrist. According to Gazili, manoeuvrists are people who can get into the mind of the opponent and mentally outwit him or her, or who can apply originality and imagination to solving a problem and are happy in chaos and uncertainty. These traits are essential in providing good advice to government about the limits of the effectiveness of military force in meeting the security challenges of the 21st century. This is particularly important because, as air, uh, because air power, as Elliot Cohen highlights, is a seductive form of military strength. When coupled with the West's susceptibility to the allure of battle, we may find ourselves in a long war that we didn't plan for, simply because we put all our money behind the military option and didn't fully explore how we could synchronize it with the other elements of national power. The military is not everything, and we need to tell government and the people that as well. And I think we can use the strategic maneuver concepts as an overarching framework that gives us the guide and the foundation for developing the discipline to think outside of our own organization in developing enduring solutions to the security challenges of the 21st century. Thank you.